Good morning, everybody. Um, Tamar, can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, I can hear you. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Um, so we have today Tamar Elkin. That's I pronounced your last name right, right? She's going to talk about healthy eating habit for before the holiday. Right. So um, if you have any question, you guys can add it on the chat or also you can unmute yourself. So I'll be here the whole entire time. So if you have any question for me, just let me know. You can just add it on the chat. OK, without further ado, tomorrow you can start. Let's see if your PowerPoint can still show. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Shana. My name is Tamar. I am a registered dietitian. And today I thought it would be helpful if we could talk about some holiday habits as you know, the holiday season is approaching and it's usually a tumultuous time, right? Because some people, you know, say they're saving all their calories for one day or they overindulge and then you kind of get stuck with a lot of extra weight or a lot of extra food that you might not want. So I want us to approach it with a little bit of a different mentality so we can go into it a little bit more healthily. Um, at any point, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself or type into the chat. I'll do my best to monitor both, but, you know, I like to keep my classes casual. So, you know, chime in, chime in if you have something, uh, something to say or a question. So this year, right, it has definitely been different the last two years. So just a reminder to be kind to yourself. It has been different than in the past. And I want you to focus on what brings you joy this holiday season, right? The last two years were maybe not the most joyful. So we want to try and focus on what can bring us joy this season. So I want to, excuse me, I want to start with the basics, right? And this goes for every day, but especially around the holidays, if you live in buildings where the heat is on, it gets really dry. And as we age, our sensation for thirst actually diminishes. It goes down with age. So you might not actually realize that you're thirsty and you could go a few hours without drinking. Now, another problem with this also, right, as we age, people complain about going to the bathroom more frequently. So they'll just stop drinking altogether because it means less trips to the bathroom. It could be medications that we're on right? Certain medications make us go to the bathroom more often. So it's just a reminder, yes, maybe it's another, you know, a few more trips to the bathroom, but dehydration is a real complication and so much so you could end up in the hospital for it. And it's so preventable. So, so, so preventable. All we have to do is remember to drink water, right? So remember that our hunger and thirst cues can get crossed. So sometimes when you feel hungry, you might not actually be hungry. You might be thirsty, so before you sit down to a meal or a snack, have a glass of water, assess how you feel. And if you still feel hungry, then you can eat, but at least you got some water in. Before eating or drinking, right? Drink, drink a glass of water. Water also helps us feel better, right? On days where we are dehydrated and we're not getting enough water, we feel kind of sluggish and tired. And we also definitely will not sleep as well. It could be that we are forced to wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom from drinking water, but your quality of sleep will be better when your body is fully hydrated. Water in the stomach also, you know, hangs out in our stomach. The more things that are in our stomach helps us feel fuller, right? So it means that we're also probably going to eat less if we're drinking all this water because we feel full already. So if weight loss is a goal of yours, this is a great place to start. And if it's not, it is still a great place to start. So just to remember that water really helps us feel our best. Don't wait to eat all day. This is a common mistake that I hear very often, right? If it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or just holiday get togethers in general, people say, oh, I'm gonna skip breakfast. I'm gonna skip lunch. I'm gonna have a big dinner tonight. That's not the way to go, right? Make sure that you get a little bit of sustenance throughout the day. This way, when you get to dinner, you're not so, 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 so hungry that you stuff your face and eat too much that you end up not feeling well, right? How many of us have been in the situation where we do that? And then after we eat, we go, oh, I have to unbutton my pants. I have to sit on the couch. This is too much, right? So by eating a little bit throughout the day, it allows us to approach the, you know, that final last meal not so, so, so hungry and ravenous that we stuff our faces, but approach it with 
you know, maybe I'll try a little bit of everything without overdoing it. So don't forget to eat breakfast. You know, that's another, another good tip. So I wanna talk about building meals to last, right? And this is something that we can take with us through and after holiday season. When we talk about meals and snacks, we wanna look for three components in every meal and every snack, okay? The three are healthy fat, fiber, and protein. And these should be the three main components of every meal and every snack, okay? So I wanna go a little bit into the science of why. Fat, fiber, and protein take a really long time for our bodies to break down, which means like we said before, they hang out in our stomach longer, right? So that means that they help keep us fuller longer as opposed to something like carbohydrates, right? If you're eating a muffin or a donut, that's pure carbohydrates. When we eat that, our body breaks it down for sugar, for energy really fast. So if we, you know, if you follow our blood sugar levels, if you have diabetes or if you don't have diabetes, what happens when we eat a lot of carbohydrates is our blood sugar levels spike up. And then what happens? Do they stay up or do they crash and come falling down? You can unmute yourself if you, if you know the answer. They rise up really sharply and then they fall really steeply, right? This is what happens with the, the peaks and valleys with our blood sugar levels going really high and then crashing, which is why we wanna balance our meals with things that don't raise our blood sugar so high and then cause it to crash because when our blood sugar level goes up and down, we go up and down. Our energy levels go up and down. Our mood goes up and down, right? So healthy fat, fiber, and protein have fat and protein have no effect on our blood sugar levels and fiber, depending where it comes from, has very minimal effect on our blood sugar levels. So altogether, they're going to give us a very consistent stream of energy because they're released into the bloodstream slowly and consistently, as opposed to just carbohydrates that come up and down. So healthy fats, fiber, and protein, okay? I want to touch upon fiber just a little bit, um, a little bit of a reminder of what fiber is and where fiber comes from. Fiber is a part of the plant, okay? It is the indigestible part of the plant. And what happens is it hangs out in our body. It gives our gut bacteria food, okay? So it helps keep our gut bacteria happy and healthy. And it has a multitude of benefits. Fiber can act like a sponge and naturally lower our cholesterol. Fiber can help reduce the risk of colorectal cancers, right? And GI diseases because fiber helps bowel movements. It helps us go to the bathroom, right? And maybe it's not everyone's favorite thing to talk about, but as a dietitian, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, right? Being regular, going to the bathroom regularly. It's very important. Fiber is one of the things that helps us do that, right? So because of that turnover, because it's forcing us to go to the bathroom more often, it takes with it a lot of, you know, those toxins, things that are trying to get out. So it helps lower our cholesterol. It helps us go to the bathroom, it helps prevent GI diseases. When it comes to diabetes, fiber is one of those things, like we had just mentioned, it keeps our blood sugar levels steady. So if you have type 2 diabetes, right, what we teach is that you want to keep your blood sugar as consistent as possible. So fiber is one of those things that helps do that, okay? Now, when it comes to fiber, right? So it acts like the sponge taking with it the extra cholesterol and it pulls it out with it, right? When we go to the bathroom, it takes out that extra cholesterol. But just like a sponge, fiber only works if we're drinking water. Because if we eat all this fiber and we don't drink any water, then the opposite happens. It sits in our stomach and we get really constipated and bloated and gassy and uncomfortable. So it needs water in order for it to work, okay? Fiber takes a long time to break down, so it also helps us stay fuller longer. So if your goal is weight loss or weight maintenance, this is the key also, right? Because when you eat foods that are really rich in fiber, you don't feel so hungry after, right? Which allows you also the energy to focus on something else. You're not constantly thinking about food. 
So that's a really quick gist of fiber. But just remember, fiber is only found in plants, okay? So the goal of that message is that we should be eating more plants, right? More plant foods. So we'll get into that in just a second. So I wanna do a little bit of activity. Um, so if you would please unmute yourself to, to contribute to this. I wanna talk about some examples of how we can get this idea, the healthy fat, the fiber and the protein in every meal. And we're gonna go through three examples of it, okay? So the first one is gonna be eggs. Eggs fall into which category? Healthy fat, fiber or protein? You can type it into the chat if you want also, if you don't wanna unmute. Which category would eggs fall into? Protein. protein. Protein, good. Now let me ask you a question. Does it fall into another category as well? Uh, fats. Healthy fat, thank you, Bruce, right? So the yolk has that healthy fat. And for a long time, it got a bad rep, right? People were afraid of eating the yolk and they would throw out the yolk and they'd only eat egg white omelets. Don't do that. Don't do that. The egg yolk has such healthy fat, important fat. Now, remember, you're not eating 12 eggs, right? We put the limit on like two, but the yolk has that healthy fat. Good. So eggs actually fall into two categories. So what's missing from this full meal? We have healthy fat and protein. What's missing? Fiber. 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 What can we add to eggs for fiber? Uh, whole wheat bread. Whole wheat bread. Meal. Excellent. What else? I heard oatmeal. We'll talk about oatmeal in just a second. We said that fiber comes from plants, right? What category of plants are we missing that we could add to our eggs? Vegetables. Vegetables, absolutely, right? If we're making an omelet, is it hard to throw in a handful of spinach and onions? Nope. If I like hard boiled eggs, is it hard to you know, eat some cucumbers and tomatoes on the side? No. No, right? So this idea that we can still get a full meal, even if it's not you know, one inside of the other, you can eat them alongside it. Good, so that was eggs. Next one, yogurt. What category is yogurt? Protein. Protein, good. Now, if I'm getting a 2%, 3% full fat yogurt, what other category could it fall into? Fat. Good, right? The fat from dairy is a healthy fat, okay? So now we have healthy fat and protein. What's missing for my yogurt? Fiber. 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 Good. What can I add to my yogurt for fiber? Mm, let's see. Oh, uh, fruit. Fruit. Absolutely, right? We can add berries. Especially if you have type 2 diabetes, berries are the best fruit you can eat because they're really high in fiber and really low in sugar. You can add bananas, but you can add berries. That would be my top recommendation. Plus, they're really delicious together. But you could do grapes, whatever you want, in your yogurt. Awesome, right? And last one. Someone mentioned oatmeal before, so I'm putting this up here for you. Oatmeal falls under which category? Fiber. Fiber, good. So oatmeal is considered a whole grain. But when you look at the label of an oatmeal package, it has only a little bit of fiber. It's not a ton of fiber. What can we add to our oatmeal for more fiber? Fruit. 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 Good, right? So we can definitely add fruit. And now there's another category I want you to think about. And it's a, this is a trick question because it falls into all three. It is a healthy fat, it has protein, and it also has fiber. Who can think of one type of food that falls into all three? Avocado. Ooh, avocado is a very good one. You're actually not wrong about that, but I don't know that I'd put avocado in my oatmeal. You could, I'm not gonna judge. But I'm, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you're right. Uh, nuts. nuts. Oh, who said that? Uh, Bruce. Bruce, you said nuts, right? You got it. Nuts are going to be that key food if you ever get stuck. If you don't know, well, what should I add to this? I'm missing one category. Nuts. Nuts are a healthy fat. Nuts have protein 
And nuts grow where? From the ground, right? They're plants. Yeah, the plant. So it makes, and that means that they have fiber, right? So if you ever get stuck, nuts or peanut butter or almond cashew butter, right? Nuts or nut butter always hit all three categories. So when we talk about oatmeal, we could add nuts on top. When I cook oatmeal on the stove, I add in like two tablespoons of peanut butter while it's cooking and I melt it in. But the idea being that yes, oatmeal has a little bit of fiber, not a ton of fiber. So there are things we can add to it for more fiber. So we said fruit, good. Nuts, good. And there's one more, that family of seeds. Pumpkin seeds, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, right? Any of the seeds. And they fall into that same idea as the nuts. They're plant-based, right? So they have fiber, they have protein, and they also have healthy fats, okay? So if you ever get stuck, those nuts and seeds are an awesome, awesome trick, okay? Um, awesome. Anyone have any questions about this? There's one more family of foods and that's going to be our beans. Okay. And I have to talk about it because beans are my favorite. So which category do beans fall into? Fiber. Fiber. Good. Cause they're from plants. And what else? Is there another one? Protein. 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 Excellent. Good. Okay. I'm glad you guys are listening. We'll talk about beans a little bit more. So this is just some ideas that I put out here. You know, people say, well, I don't know what to eat for breakfast. I don't know what to eat for lunch. So we talked about eggs with spinach and cheese, right? You get that healthy fat from the eggs. You get some fat from the dairy. You get spinach. It's a perfect meal, right? You want a slice of whole grain toast? Awesome. Avocado and an egg on whole grain toast, right? Um, we had someone say avocado before. I don't remember who said that, sorry. But it was healthy fat fiber. Avocados actually also have a little bit of protein. You can add an egg. You don't have to add an egg on toast, right? It is a great breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You can add spices. You can add a slice of lox. You can add, you know, it's a, it's a great, a very versatile type of, of meal, avocado on toast. Um, a whole grain waffle with some nut butter, like peanut butter or almond berry or almond butter and some berries or nuts and seeds on top. It's very filling whole wheat pasta with tomato sauce and vegetables, right? You have some fiber from the whole wheat pasta, you have fiber from the tomato sauce, you have fiber from the vegetables together. That is a good filling meal. And if you need a snack, you can always throw together some nuts, right? Remember we said that that hits all three categories, a little bit of dried fruit or dark chocolate chips for some sweetness. We just wanna make sure that there's no added sugar. Any questions about that? So if you are not being home for the holidays and you are invited out or something, one thing I like to do always is if you're invited and they ask you to bring something <clears throat> or volunteer to bring something, I, I prefer to make something or bring something that I know is healthy so that wherever I go, I know at least I have one good option to eat, okay? So you can use that to your advantage. If you are home and you're cooking all day, Make sure you keep some cut up peppers or cucumbers or fruit around for you to snack on so that you remember to eat something and that you're not, you know, going all day without eating something and then saving everything for, you know, that last big meal of the day. And then we eat too much and we, you know, could potentially regret it. So we want to think about moderation, not deprivation. Okay. We're not saying no, right? We don't want to say no to anything because the holidays are supposed to be fun and it's supposed to be a, you know, a joyous time, but we don't want to go overboard, right? We don't want to get to a point where we regret things. They can be emotional, right? A lot of holidays can be difficult. They can be fun. They can be stressful. They can be a lot of different things. So one thing we want to do is we want to avoid the food guilt, right? Food and company is meant to be enjoyable. You know, sometimes, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but it is meant to bring joy and comfort, not stress and anxiety. So, you know, how we can eat makes a big difference. When it comes to desserts and alcohol, right? This is where we want to be a little bit extra when it comes to mindfulness. Three bites of a dessert, okay? Three bites, that's that three bite rule. There was a study done in Harvard where they, put out a bunch of desserts and they let one group of people take three bites and they let the other group of people free range, eat as much as you want. The people who had three bites 
felt the same level of happiness, you know, indulging in those desserts as the people who had a free range. People who had free range ate like 30 to 50% more than the people who had the three bites, but they felt the same level of happiness, right? That same level of satisfaction. So it actually goes to show you that we don't need to eat the whole piece of cake. You can really get that same satisfaction from eating, you know, three bites and calling it quits. Same thing with alcohol, right? Try to stick to one to two glasses. If you want some extra benefit, right? Red wine has those antioxidants that have some potential health benefits. So, you know, that's always a good place. Um, one to two at max, right? We don't want to overdo it. So some other tips, right? We want to factor these mindful indulgences into the big day or every other day. We know that, you know, people bake or there's treats lying around. So we just want to make room for them in our schedule, right? We don't want to be treating all day long. Cook less. If you're the person that's cooking for the family or for yourself or for your friends, you know, maybe instead of three or four or five desserts, try one or two really special ones, right? Nobody ever is upset that there's not enough dessert, right? As long as there are one or two special ones, it helps prevent more temptation. This way you can really focus on like the one or two that are available. And it also helps reduce food waste, right? Because not all of them always get eaten. So it creates a lot of waste. Eat mindfully, right? And this goes back to that idea of paying attention. Really try and be present to what you're eating, how you're eating, when you're eating, right? So one, you know, one thing, and we, we teach kids this also, right? Avoid snacking or eating in front of the TV. We don't even realize if you're sitting in front of the TV, I mean, you could just sit and chomp on chips or cookies or crackers or whatever for an hour. And then you finish the bag and you're like, Ooh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. But it's so easy because you're not really paying attention. If you're talking to someone, talk to them, right? If you have a plate of food in front of you, spend that time talking to the person you know, instead of eating and talking because you eat a lot more than you want or a lot more than you realize. Eat when you can fully focus on your plate, when you can devote that attention to it. Size down. Um, this is the idea of portion distortion, right? Things in our country every year, every decade get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? I'll give you an example. How many of us have ever been to a diner before? Okay. How many of us have ever gotten an omelet from a diner? Does that omelet look anything like the omelet you would make for yourself at home? No, right? It's way bigger. It's like extra fluffy. They fold it in half and it's like sky high, right? And that's because they use up to like six eggs to make one omelet, okay? Now if we're home and we said two eggs is the serving size, that's three portions of breakfast or lunch or whatever that you're eating in one meal, right? So the idea that these portions just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And we don't need to be eating that much. Two eggs for an omelet is a perfect amount. You don't need six eggs unless you're like a football player, right? So we want to try and choose smaller portions. And a good tip is if, you know, if you're home, if you're out, use the salad plate, use a smaller plate. Fill up that plate, because if you take a bigger plate, guess what? You're going to want to fill up the bigger plate, right? So sticking to smaller plates, using a salad fork, which is going to be smaller than the dinner fork, small drinks, right? We don't need, you know, 72 ounces of a soda. If you want a soda, you know, try and stick to a kid size, a small, small, small serving. And always choose vegetables as a side, right? And this is if you're at a restaurant, at someone's house, at home, Choosing salad or vegetables as a side, like we said with the fiber, right? It takes up a lot of room in your stomach. So you'll get full from the vegetables and you'll have a little bit of room left for, you know, whatever the mains are. But really we wanna try and fill up on the vegetables first. This one I put in here for my dad, right? Chew slowly because we make fun of my dad that he just shovels his food, right? He doesn't even chew, he just inhales it. So take a second. Force yourself to slow down. Put the fork down in between bites. Have a drink. Don't talk with your mouth full, right? I mean, these things sound silly to say out loud, but you don't realize how quickly you can eat. And what happens when we eat too quickly, right? 
Our brain and our stomach take about 20 minutes to talk to one another to say, hey, you know what? I'm starting to fill up, right? Slow down. But if you eat really, really, really quickly and you haven't hit that 20 minute mark, you go, oh, I still feel kind of hungry. I'm gonna go back for seconds. And then you fill up another plate, okay? Now within that 20 minute mark, you might've eaten two full plates. And then what happens after that 20 minute mark? How do you feel? Stuffed, right? That's that unbutton your pants, uncomfortable, have to lay on the couch kind of feeling. So we wanna avoid that, right? So one way to avoid that, right, is to walk it off. And this goes for everyone, but especially if you have type two diabetes, what is the best thing you can do after you eat? Walk. Walk, thank you. So walking after any meal, it also helps aid in digestion, right? It helps keep our body moving, which helps keep everything that we just ate moving, right? It helps with that transition down. Exercise also helps with our mental health. If, you know, the, the emotions of the holidays are getting to you, if you're stressed, if you're anxious, if you're angry, if you go for a 10, 20 minute walk, how do you feel afterwards? Good. A little Good. bit better? Yeah. Are you gonna feel worse? Are you gonna go, oh, I wish I didn't just spend 20 minutes walking? No, right? You feel a little bit better. It helps improve our mood. It also has a positive effect on our GI tract, right? And that's what I was saying. It helps things move along. It keeps things moving. So, you know, exercise has been shown to help prevent peptic ulcers, heartburn, IBS, it's irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, diverticular disease, constipation, and colorectal cancer, right? And again, it has to do with our body moving things through it, right? When you force things to move through. When we don't exercise, things just sit there, right? And they sit there and they grow and it's not always the best thing. So we wanna make sure that when we exercise, we keep things moving. It also helps reduce the risk of heart disease. It helps lower our triglycerides, it helps lower cholesterol and it helps lower blood pressure. It helps with weight loss or weight maintenance. Walking after meals can help you hit that calorie deficit, right? If we're trying to lose weight and we eat this much, we could, not move, right? And then our calories that we're eating is more than how much we're burning. When that happens and you eat, 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 and we're not exercising, what happens to our weight? Goes up. It goes up, right? So we wanna be in this kind of balance. We wanna be burning either equal or more calories than we're eating so that we don't gain too much weight because too much weight comes with a whole other host of problems, right? So we wanna make sure that we're in that other kind of balance. It also helps manage blood sugar levels. This is how we started, right? Especially if we have type two diabetes, when we eat, our blood sugar goes up. Exercise helps bring our blood sugar down. So if we have type two diabetes, as soon as we're done eating, the best thing we can do is go for a walk to help lower our blood pressure or blood sugar, excuse me. Um, and you know the science behind that is because we use glucose for energy, right? What we just ate has some glucose that our body breaks down, right? Those carbohydrates break down into glucose that we use for energy. So our blood glucose levels rise, that's our blood sugar, right? So exercising after helps prevent it from going too high and then a fall, you know, a steep fall. It helps it go up a little bit and then kind of balance out, which is what we want. Any questions about this? Okay. So just a, an example of, you know, something for you to think about if you think it's worth it, okay? How many of us have ever been to the cheesecake factory before? Or, you know, a diner that serves a, a hefty piece of cheesecake, right? So one slice of cheesecake factory, pumpkin cheesecake, I chose pumpkin because it's fall, right? Has a thousand sixty calories per serving. 79 grams of fat, 61 grams of sugar, and 520 milligrams of sodium. What does that look like for us? To burn 1,060 calories, you'd have to walk for six and, a half six and a half hours at two miles an hour pace. You'd have to do housework for four and a half hours or spend three hours biking. Now, if you think about it, 
Is it easy to eat a slice of Cheesecake Factory cheesecake? It's pretty easy, right? Is it easy to go biking for three hours? No, that's a lot, right? So the idea here, back to that study that was done in Harvard, that three bite rule, you can still enjoy it, right? And you can have three bites of it and you can still get that same satisfaction without all of the extra calories and fat and sugar, right? So try to stick to that three bite rule. So what to eat to stay healthier this winter? We're gonna run through some examples, okay? The big three tips, more fruits and vegetables, less salt and less added sugar, okay? More fruits and vegetables, less salt, less added sugar. And I don't necessarily mean salt like, you know, if you're cooking and you sprinkle some salt on top, that's not the kind of salt I'm talking about. What kind of salt am I talking about? Who knows? Table talking salt? About, no, not table salt. Table salt, you know, if you're home and you're cooking and you add a little bit to your, you know, your roasted vegetables, that's okay. I'm talking about like preserved food sodium, right? Because that sodium is used as a preservative in packaged food, processed food, canned food, fast food, restaurant food, right? These types of food are loaded with that sodium. And that's the kind of sodium that raises our blood pressure, that can cause heart disease, that helps us gain weight. So we really wanna try and stay away from that kind of sodium. Not the table salt, you know, that you know, a sprinkle here, a sprinkle there is okay. I'm more concerned about that really heavily processed packaged food. Uh, and then less added sugar, right? This is, if you're trying to make any change this holiday season, that is my number one piece of advice. Watch the added sugar. Turn over any package of anything you have in your house and look at the nutrition facts label where it says grams of added sugar. And you will be amazed. Added sugar is in almost absolutely everything we eat. From a can of, you know, a jar of uh, ragu tomato sauce to salad dressing, right? Things that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Ketchup, the number two ingredient in ketchup is sugar, right? And these things really add up. So all day long, we're eating so much added sugar without realizing it. So if you're looking for somewhere to start, that's a great place. So, okay, these are the three, th or those are my three tips, more fruits and vegetables, less of that sodium and less added sugar. So what can we eat? That's what I wanna focus on, right? In this area, right, what's in season? We have apples and pears, kale or those dark leafy greens, winter squash, which we're about to talk about, cabbage and Brussels sprouts, pomegranates. Now is the perfect pomegranate season. They're big and they're beautiful. Broccoli, cauliflower, beets, and uh, potatoes or sweet potatoes, okay? Some ideas of what to do with them, you know, salad, soup, roasted as a side, roasted just like that. Some of them you can eat raw, right? Beets and Brussels sprouts, you can also eat raw. And some of the benefits, what do they all have in common? Where do they grow? In the ground. In the ground, thank you. These are all vegetables, right? Or fruit. They all have fiber. They all have fiber. And not only do they have fiber, they also have lots of other benefits, okay? Beets, if you have high blood pressure, beets are the best food you can eat for high blood pressure. Uh, vitamin K, right? If we want healthy blood, healthy immune system, those dark leafy greens, those are the best things we can eat. There are a lot of benefits in here. And all of these fruits and vegetables also help lower our blood pressure, have anti-inflammatory properties to them, have antioxidants in their colors, right? The pomegranates, that deep red, beautiful, the beets, that deep purple, they all have those antioxidants in them that have a lot of protective effects. Any questions about any of this? Okay, so how can we warm up this, this winter season, right? What are some things we can make with everything we just mentioned? Soup is gonna be a great one, right? And if you make soup, do you make only one cup of soup? No, right, you make a big batch of soup. So if you don't eat it all at once, it's a great thing to freeze and take out of the freezer when you need it next. Oatmeal, we talked about. Oatmeal is something so fun and so versatile, right? First of all, you can make savory oatmeal. I took a cooking class once and we made savory oatmeal and we made a fried egg and some sauteed vegetables. 
and we ate it on top of the oatmeal. I had never done it before, but it was very interesting and I would do it again. So that's, you know, a fun way to think about it. You could add pumpkin, you could add applesauce, you could add all the different nutmeg, vanilla, cinnamon, cardamom, right? You could add a lot of flavors to your oatmeal without adding any added sugar. Seasonal salads, this is, you know, a way to spice things up. If you are eating a salad, you can always add anything we just talked about, right? Kale, cauliflower, roasted squash, right? These are things you can all add to your salad. Frittata, if you have eggs and you have vegetables, you have all the ingredients for a frittata, right? It just means that you bake it and you leave it in there and you can throw in cheese, you can throw in meat, you can throw in eggs and vegetables. And there you go, right? Have a slice of that and it's a full meal. Chili, okay? How do we make chili? You take ground beef or ground turkey. You could take beans, you could take lentils and there's no limit, right? You can do red beans, black beans. You could add white beans, you could add lentils. You could make this chili pop, right? With so much added health benefits to it. And then stuffed peppers, stuffed pumpkins, stuffed potatoes, right? Where the base is a vegetable and you can fill it with whole grains, buckwheat, barley, rice, quinoa, and vegetables, right? Again, it could be a full meal. Some more seasonal ideas. If you are making a salad or a slaw, right? Kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, carrots, cabbage, apples. These are all different ingredients that you can use to make a seasonal slaw, right? Instead of our regular coleslaw, we can add some other types of crunch to it. Mashed potatoes, right? Now, what's one of the second ingredients in mashed potatoes after potatoes? Uh, butter. Butter, cream, sour cream. I've seen recipes with cream cheese in there, right? So we're taking the potato, which by itself could be healthy, and adding a whole slew of layers of added fat, right? Now, a little bit is fine, but we don't, you know, who really eats only a little bit of mashed potatoes, right? Let's be honest. They're very good when they're made with all that cream and butter, right? So something we can do is half and half. So we can take half mashed potatoes and half parsnip for a little bit of sweetness or, you know, mashed cauliflower. You can steam cauliflower. You could do all three and you can make a mix that way with your potatoes to make it a little bit healthier. You could mix potato and sweet potato or do just a side of mashed sweet potato. The idea here being, right, we wanna add a little bit less fat, make it a little bit more healthy. Beans and lentils. We can add beans and lentils to anything we make. I told you at the beginning, beans are one of my favorite foods. So we had to talk about them, right? Any soup, any salad, any side, you can add beans and lentils to, and it only makes it healthier and adds more protein and adds, what? What do beans and lentils give us also? Fiber. Fiber, you got it, Bruce. You're on your game today. Fruit for sweetness, right? If you're looking to satisfy your sweet tooth, if you're baking, right? We can use mashed bananas, applesauce. We can use those for sweetness and help cut back on some of that added sugar that we talked about. And then a, a garnish, right? Anything nuts and seeds, wherever we can throw them in, throw them in, right? Sprinkle them on top of your salad, sprinkle them on top of your soup, sprinkle them on top of your yogurt, your oatmeal. They just add a lot of extra health benefits. Any question about any of these suggestions? Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about are some of these winter squashes, okay? Another word for winter squashes are gourds, okay? So this is my little joke, aren't they gorgeous? These are the things that are in season now. And I just wanted to run through some of them with you in case you've seen them and you weren't really sure what to do with them. Okay, so the first one is delicata squash. Is anyone familiar with this or has tried it? So this is a winter squash that has a sweet nutty flavor and it has a thin edible skin, which means you can cut it and roast it just like that. You don't have to do anything, you know, give it a quick rinse before you cut it, that's it. You can eat the peel, it's really thin and it is very delicious. I'll roast some of these with just a little bit of olive oil. I don't add anything else. And you can eat them like that. You can cut them into rings and you can eat them like that. You can throw them on salad. You can eat them however you like. They're really versatile and they're really delicious. This is butternut squash. This one's probably a little bit more common. This one has a much harder peel, 
which if it is a struggle for you to peel, um, there are a few tricks you can do. You could cut it in half and then roast it like that and then scoop out the flesh. You can buy it pre-peeled. You can buy it pre-cut um, or frozen. They sell it frozen also. So if you're trying to make a side or a soup, those might be better options. This little cutie is a honey nut squash. So it looks like this one, right? This is the butternut squash. The honey nut squash is like a shade darker, but looks very similar. And it's basically a version of a mini butternut squash. It has a much more concentrated flavor. So it's actually sweeter tasting than the butternut squash. Also delicious and smaller. So if you struggle with the size of a butternut squash, or if you're only one or two people and you don't really need a whole one, this is your, this is your solution right here. It's a nice smaller size. So if you look at this picture in the middle, if you're able to see the screen, that's an example of a stuffed squash where you take it out, right? And you scoop out some of the inside and you can either cut it up like that and add it to quinoa and you know sauteed mushrooms and garlic and onions, something like that. And then put it back in the squash and you serve it like that and you can eat the whole thing, right? You can eat the squash, you can eat the peel and you can eat all the filling inside. This honey nut squash has a thin peel so you can eat the, you can eat the peel. This is a kaboka squash, otherwise known as a Japanese pumpkin. And it's kind of like a cross between a sweet potato and a pumpkin. It's a little bit starchier and a little bit like thicker tasting, if that makes sense. But it is actually really low in calories, right? A cup of this has only 40 calories and seven grams of carbohydrates, which makes, which makes it a very type two diabetes friendly food. It's a winter squash that will not really raise your blood sugar too high. So it's great. Um, in Japan, they make cheesecake out of this. They make their pumpkin cheesecake with this. It's really good. I make soup with this. You can add it to curries. You can roast it just like that. Um, it's a great, fun new vegetable to try if you're trying to look for something new. Um, this peel is thin but hard. So you can sometimes find it cut in half also, which helps. This is, has anyone seen this before? Anyone know what this is called? This is spaghetti squash. And this is a wild vegetable. When you cut it into rings and you bake it, if you take a fork and you kind of just fork through it or like rake it, it turns into these little, little, little tiny, tiny strings. I don't know if you can see the pictures well enough on the screen, but it looks almost like spaghetti. Now, don't be fooled. It doesn't really taste like spaghetti, but you can use it in any way that you would use spaghetti. I've seen people make casseroles with it. You can mix it with spaghetti so that you're not eating as much spaghetti, right? You're eating also vegetables with your spaghetti. I've seen people make, um, you know, little uh, baked zitis with it, you know, something like that, a little sauce and cheese on top. It's a pretty fun vegetable. Um, and it's, you just cut it into rings and bake it. And then you just take the fork, like that picture on the left or this middle picture, and you just have scrape it out with the fork and it comes into these like strings like spaghetti. So it's really low in carbohydrates as well, which is what makes it a nice alternative to spaghetti or an enhancer, right? So this way you're not eating all of that pasta, you're eating half pasta, half squash. And this is our last one. This is an acorn squash. Has anyone ever seen these before? These I think are a little bit more common. Um, it has a nice nutty flavor. It has a thin edible skin as well, and it has light squash notes, but really a little bit more nutty. Packed with vitamin A, also fiber. Um, you can roast it like that, you can make soup. This is a really good one for stuffing. If you look at that image on the left, if you hollow out the inside, it full, it, um, you know, it looks like an acorn when it's standing upright, but when you slice it in half, it forms these really nice looking bowls. So you can always stuff that. I've seen that uh, served as well, stuffed. And then this is just some ideas what to do. So we reduce our food waste, right? We don't wanna be throwing away too much food. You can always roast the seeds that come in these squashes, right? Like pumpkin seeds, right? Pepitas, that's a famous snack. That's a good thing to snack on. These, these squash seeds also are in the same family. So you just wanna wash them, dry them with a paper towel, lay them on a baking sheet lined with parchment paper, and just drizzle it with a little bit of oil. You can add seasoning to it if you want. You can make them spicy. You can add a little bit of cinnamon. You can add salt and pepper. 
And then you just roast them around like 275 degrees Fahrenheit for like 20, 25 minutes until they start to brown. Just keep an eye on them. We don't want them to get too hot or too burnt, right? We don't want to break down the fat that's in the seeds. So remember, because seeds fall into those three categories, right? Healthy fat, fiber, and protein. So this is a good, good snack to keep on hand. So all of these squashes, all of these winter squashes are great sources of what's called beta carotene. And that's why they all, you know, if you've noticed the color scheme of them, they all have that like orange yellow color to them, which helps provide that beta carotene, which our body turns into vitamin A, right? So it's the same thing that sweet potatoes have, that carrots have. So they're really good for our eye health and they're good for our immune system. So just some nutrition facts to run through, right? Um, one cup of winter squash has about 39 calories, which is very low. And it has about 10 grams of carbohydrates, depending on which one, has fiber, no grams of added sugar, right? The, the sugars that listed here are part of those carbohydrates. Um, and it has a lot of vitamin A, right? And so it has that fiber, it has magnesium and potassium, which helps our blood pressure, helps our heart vitamin C, it has some vitamin B6 and protein, right? A tiny, tiny little bit of protein, but just something to keep in mind. So they're a really high quality food to keep on hand this holiday season. And then these are my references. I'm happy to share. Ooh, I'm happy to share if anyone has uh, any questions. I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to open the floor for questions. Has anyone tried any of those squashes that we just talked about? Yeah. Yeah. Acorn squash is very nice. Oh, very good. Lovely. I like I acorn squash too. I make it pretty often when it's the fall. This is the season for it. So, it's, uh, yeah. as a matter of fact, I'll be, I'll be bringing it probably to my daughter. Oh, perfect. See, I love that. That's what we talked about, right? Bringing something healthy with you so you know you have one awesome dish that at least you know. Well, some sweet potato. Um, I may try to experiment and combine them a little bit to work. Maybe it'll be a nice little um, sweet vegetable potato mashed potato effect. I love that. You know, Sweet potatoes is something that, you know, most people are know and are familiar with. So it's fun to change it up a little bit. Like the acorn squash, maybe not everyone's tried. So it's a nice balance. A combination of the two of them could be very good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank, thank you for you. sharing. <laughs> Anyone else have anything they've tried or made or any other questions I can answer? Okay. Um, we are going to do this again in December on, let me get the date right, uh, December 13th, Monday, December 13th at 11. So I hope you come back. We're going to talk about a little bit more of uh, general nutrition. We'll go through some, some more tips and tricks. If you liked them today, we'll give, a, we'll give another more in-depth class about those. Thank you for participating. Yeah.